Hi, it's Cindy Harrison with Matt Davis. We're going to talk about the Cardiac Ischemia Medical Directive that's coming into force on July 17th of 2017. Keep hearing that date. I know. It's nice that they doubled the 17. Mm -hmm. That was thoughtful. Just remember. <laughs> so there's three things we're going to talk about, three points at which practice is going to change in this Cardiac Ischemia Directive. The first being um, what to do differently when you find a patient who is STEMI positive. The second being essentially there's a new functional nitroglycerin contraindication and the third being a quick note on morphine for chest pain which has changed in uh, ACLS so all medics will see it being used differently either in their practice or in hospital when they're dropping patients off. So first of all when we find somebody that's STEMI positive two things we're going to do first is we're going to put on the pads that's actually a BLS update can you tell us a little bit Matt about why it's so important to put on pads so the, the importance of, of pads on in these patients is STEMI patients. They, they have a higher chance of going into cardiac arrest than your average person on the street. So the, the anticipation is these patients are, are sick, could potentially go into cardiac arrest, and having the pads on will decrease that time to first shock. And we know that uh, people with uh, STEMIs often go into VF, VT, cardiac arrests, and the best treatment for that is early defibrillation. So having the pads on will save time and potentially save a life. It's, it's a lot nicer to try to get those pad packages open when your patient's still talking to you, I find. Less stressful. Yeah. Um, second thing is if a patient is STEMI positive, we're going to stop at three nitro instead of continuing to six. Why is that? Why is three the limit now? So nitroglycerin has never had any mortality uh, or morbidity benefit for uh, those suffering from STEMI. So there's conflicting evidence out there. In fact, nitroglycerin may actually do some harm in these patients. Uh, so the idea is that if they're not responding to three doses of nitroglycerin in terms of their ischemic chest pain getting better, then increasing the amount of, of uses of it is not going to help their pain any and could potentially cause them harm. Okay. Three nitros. So anytime we have a patient who is STEMI positive, we're going to put on the pads and stop at three nitros. That's correct. You may stop earlier if their chest pain resolves and you don't need to continue on with the, the nitroglycerin, but a maximum of three doses for their, their cardiac ischemic pain. Yeah, fair suffering enough. suffering from STEMI. Yeah, as long, and as also obviously as long as their uh, vitals stay within the parameters, et cetera. That is correct. Okay. Um, what if a patient is both STEMI positive and has uh, pulmonary edema secondary to CHF? So... You have to think, okay, well, why are, they, why are they having pulmonary edema? It's most likely because their heart is not functioning properly because it is ischemic. Uh, in these cases, it stands that they're having a STEMI, so the contraindication still exists. The maximum amount of nitroglycerin they can receive is three doses. Again, it's going to be a, a clinical judgment, but if they meet the, the criteria for CPAP, then that would be an excellent use of CPAP in these patients to help with their CHF. Again, if they meet the, the conditions, then by all means, CPAP would be another reasonable option for treating their CHF. Okay. Uh, the second thing we're going to talk about is the contraindication. It actually exists currently, but we haven't been emphasizing it. So the contraindication for nitro says a 12-lead ECG compatible with right ventricular infarct. And the new part is that there's a clinical consideration that spells out more particularly when and how we're to address this. Yeah, so we've discussed that at many, many research regards to nitroglycerin use in right ventricular infarcts. And so, again, we've often said that patients who have a right ventricular infarct are going to declare themselves as being out of the directive. These patients often present bradycardic and hypotensive and therefore do not meet the, the uh, conditions for giving nitroglycerin. So the thought was, you know, if you recognized yet to the 12-lead ECG and you recognize signs of a right ventricular infarct on that 12-lead ECG, then you just documented that and you did not have to give nitroglycerin. As stated earlier, nitroglycerin is not life-saving. It doesn't prevent mortality. It doesn't, you know, help with morbidity. Uh, so it's not a life-saving intervention. So, you know, previously we said if you thought it was an RVI, document it. You don't have to give nitroglycerin. Now the province has come out and stated that, you know, if you suspect that uh, if the patient has an inferior MI and you want to rule out a right ventricular infarct, then you can do a modified 12-lead ECG to look for that right-sided infarct. And if they have a right-sided infarct, then again, that's a contraindication to giving nitroglycerin. At the end of the day, again, the most important thing with these patients is getting them to definitive care. They need that coronary artery opened up, be it by thrombolysis or a stent. So, you know, we want to minimize seed time. The most important thing is getting them, getting them to the hospital. 
So we don't want to increase scene time by doing these uh, modified 15 lead ECG. So if they are out of criteria for getting nitroglycerin in the first place, they're bradycardic, then you don't have to do a 15 lead ECG. Okay, so basically we just run down the medical directive exactly the same way. If a patient's out, they're out. But if the patient is still in the directive, still fitting the parameters of the directive, you're thinking about nitro and you find an inferior MI on that pre-intervention 12 lead, that's the time that you want to do this. In fact, not even a 15 lead, but just a modified 12 lead. So let's have a look quickly at that. Once we've run completely down the medical directive, patient is still in the medical directives, and then we look at their 12 lead and find ST elevation in the inferior leads, which is leads 2, 3, and AVF in this bottom left-hand corner of the 12 lead. Looks like a capital L. If we find ST elevation there, we know the patient is having ischemia to the inferior wall, the bottom of the heart that sits on the diaphragm, that flat part on the bottom. And the reason that's of, of interest is because it's telling us that there's a blockage in the artery to that part of the wall, and it could be that just the inferior wall is infarcting, or the blockage could be higher up, and actually um, both the inferior wall and the right ventricle are being affected. So that's why we want to go around and look. The 12 lead doesn't look specifically at the right ventricle, does it, Matt? It doesn't specifically look at the right ventricle itself. There are signs on the 12 lead that you could have a right ventricle infarct. Uh, for instance, if you have ST elevation in V1, that's your most rightward lead. So if you have ST elevation in V1 in the setting of an inferior STEMI, that's an indication that there is a right ventricle infarct. So if you recognize this and you were to document this on your ACR and say, I'm not going to give nitroglycerin because I'm concerned about a right ventricle infarct, then that's great care. If you do the modified 12 lead ECG and you notice ST elevation in V1 with that, which we'll get to here shortly, then you can withhold nitroglycerin in that patient and you document that. Perfect. So a quick word on how to do a modified, just to review. Um, essentially, you take V4 off of its location and you just put it on the mirror image on the other side. V4R is what it's called now. A couple of key points when we do this, the machine does not know that we moved that sticker over. The machine thinks V4 is V4 is V4. So when you print out this modified 12 lead, it's still going to be calling this lead V4, but in fact, you know as the medic, as the sly devil that moved that sticker over, you know that it's actually V4R. So you're gonna to have to interpret this modified 12 better than the machine is, because if you look here, this was a V4R, but actually the machine's still calling it V4, and it's still interpreting that to be an anterior lead. So this is reading as an anterior infarct, but it's not at all. It's actually showing a right-sided infarct. The other point is how to document it. So on the actual 12 lead that spits out, with pen, you should actually modify that and say this is V4R so that anybody downstream, any of the physicians or nurses who are caring for patient that see this modified 12 know that it's a modified. And the other place is actually on the ACR or PCR. You should put down in your interpretation that it's a modified 12 lead and what your findings are. In, in this case, there's elevation in V4R. And this is, a, this is a great 12 lead ECG or modified 12 lead ECG. If you look at V1, you actually have ST elevation in V1, which is your most rightward lead. So that's telling me in the setting of this inferior infarct that this patient most likely has a right ventricular infarct. We move the lead over to V4R, and sure enough, they have a right ventricular infarct. There's some other signs on this, you know, looking at the inferior leads. The uh, ST elevation in three is greater than two, which is another sign that potentially this patient has a right ventricular infarct. One thing to note with your, when you're moving that lead over to the V4R, your voltage criteria is not going to be as big as you would, what you would see with your, your anterior leads. It's getting further away from the left ventricle, so your amount of voltage is going to be much smaller. So, you know, it takes very minimal ST elevation with this lead to suggest that the patient is having a right ventricle infarct. Again, the right ventricle, in terms of myocardium, has much less myocardium than the left ventricle, so that voltage is going to be much less on that, that right side. So we're just looking for a small amount of elevation in, in V4R to confirm that. So one millimeter or more is enough, eh, in that V4R? That is correct. Okay. And then if we find one millimeter or more in V4R, uh, what are we going to do about it? So in this case, I mean, it's getting the patient to definitive care and, of course, withholding nitroglycerin. The thought is that these patients are preload dependent, and by giving them nitroglycerin, you could potentially cause them to become more hypotensive. 
Stay tuned for some research coming out of the southwest in regards to nitroglycerin use in right ventricle infarcts. Mm -hmm. We'll be sending that in July and hopefully get a manuscript out and we will disseminate that, that information as, as we gather it. Exciting. Lastly, uh, this is a change that's happening ACLS wide, so all medics might notice it, and for ACPs, it's going to change their practice. So there's one less contraindication for morphine administration in the setting of cardiac ischemia. So any injury to the head, chest, belly, or pelvis, that's out. Easy enough. This is a change that's uh, quite interesting. So morphine now will only be given to patients complaining of severe pain, which is defined as pain 7 out of 10 or more. What is up with this? So the use of morphine for ACS used to be a class 1 recommendation. In the 2015 guidelines, it's actually been bumped down to a class 2 recommendation, which means there's conflicting evidence as to whether or not it is uh, an effective treatment for ACS. So looking at the side effects versus the benefit, it's thought that we should be more selective in who actually gets morphine because some research shows that it actually can increase morbidity and potentially mortality in patients, and some indicate that it doesn't. So at this time, we're going to be more selective. And it's thought that, you know, if patients are having severe chest pain despite, the, you know, going through their nitroglycerin, um, using nitroglycerin to help them with their pain, if they're still having severe pain, which can, you know, is rated as a 7 out of 10, then the, the patient can receive morphine. So basically, we're just going to be more selective with who gets morphine because the evidence says, you know, it may not be as good as once what we once thought it was for, for treating these patients. So Mona's not meeting us at the door anymore. It just seems to be A these days. <laughs> It's getting easier and easier. easier. <laughs> What's not to love about that? So I'm hearing you say that we should think about morphine at the same time, but to have a much more nuanced administration, essentially. So we're still going to consider morphine after 3-nitro if the patient's still having chest pain, but we won't necessarily give it unless the patient has 7 out of 10 or more. That's, then we would, then we'd that's go ahead. basically severe, severe chest pain. And the question is, you know, what constitutes severe chest pain? Everything's going to be different. So the idea is using a numerical scale, you know, if they have a chest pain rated as 7 or greater, then you can go ahead and, and give morphine. Again, understanding that, you know, some research actually shows that morphine may be harmful in some, some patients. So verdict's still not out there as to, to whether or not it, it uh, is good versus bad. So class two means, you know, it may, may potentially not be as good as once we thought it was. What's the theory about why morphine uh, may be harmful? So the thought is that it actually may cause issues with platelets and may actually cause the platelets to adhere more. So by giving morphine, you may actually be making the coronary thrombus worse and potentially the interventions used to open up that artery, something like a thrombolytic in those patients that receive morphine, may potentially not be as effective. So if we meet somebody with chest pain, pelt them with aspirin, and then you know, 15 minutes later, give them a bit of morphine, then that morphine might be undoing the good of the aspirin, which is actually a life-saving drug? Potentially. I mean, it's potential. There's conflicting studies out there right now, so I think at this time we're not 100% sure. I think the idea has been moved based on the evidence, looking at all the, the trials out there, that, you know, we need to not be as liberal as we once were using morphine because some studies show that it could potentially cause cause some harm. Okay, well, that's uh, that's quite a change. So interesting to know the theory behind it. Um, we'll stay tuned to see what evidence comes down the pipe. All right, so those are the three changes. So just to recap, once we find a patient who is STEMI positive, we're going to slap on those pads immediately, and we stop with 3-nitro. If we find a patient has a right ventricular MI, then we would not give any nitro. And if we're considering morphine, we would only give it to patients who have 7 out of 10 or greater chest pain. That is correct. And Matt, what is the date that we're going to implement all of these changes? July 17, 17. Fantastic. Thanks so much.